Hello, cinefans. I'm Kendall Kruver, and this is Watching Classic Movies. My guest, Laura Gabrielle, is the author of Captain of Her Soul, The Life of Marion Davies. We talked about Davies' career, which was more successful than rumor would have it, her unique and mysterious long-term relationship with William Randolph Hearst, the enormous good she did for her friends, family, and the community, and how unraveling the myths about her is a crucial part of telling her story. Welcome, Laura. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's really wonderful to be here. Well, one of the things that fascinated me about your book was that you had access to a series of tapes that Marion Davies had recorded about her life. And I wondered what the experience of hearing her voice tell, you know, what she was willing to tell about her life on these tapes was like. It was really fascinating because I was able to not only hear what Marion had to say about her own life, but how she presented it in the context of that particular time in her life, which is an important thing to remember that she recorded these tapes at a difficult time in her life. But I was able to listen to her life stories from her own perspective at that particular time. And the person who was interviewing her is still alive and he could give me further context on uh, on what she was saying and why she was saying it and why they ultimately abandoned the project. It was supposed to turn into an autobiography. It, it, it didn't, they, they stopped the tapes. So I also got to hear the way she spoke and the way she spoke about other people and how those tapes were different from what ultimately became the times we had, which is the posthumous cut and paste of those tapes. So Marion didn't do anything with those tapes for, for reasons that they agreed upon. And then after she died, these two editors came, came into the picture and took the tapes and made them into a narrative um, that was sort of like what Marion Davies would have maybe said if she had finished the autobiographical tapes. So because of the nature of the work, it's it, it's not terribly, calling it a memoir is not exactly accurate because it's not Marion's words. Yeah. Now the person she spoke to, was that Stan Flink? Stanley Flink, yes. He, he was he was a journalist. Mm -hmm. A journalist from life. Yeah. Okay, so Stan Flink was a journalist from life. Now why, why did she give him this access? I mean, what do you think her goal was? And because he was there a lot in, in, in essence of yes. a friend. He was. he was a friend. He was there. But she, but she also wanted him to report on her life. I, why at that time in her life was that something that she asked him to do? I think she had been out of the public eye for a while. She didn't necessarily want stardom um, or or anything, but I think that I think that she uh, she was interested in this article that I think was actually floated by Stan Flink. Uh, he asked her if she would like to do this this piece for life magazine called life visits marion davies it was sort of an extension of a uh, a standard life feature life visits dot 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 and she said yes she said okay so they started doing she st they started planning for this life visits marion davies piece and it turned out to be Good timing, bad timing, I don't know what we, we want to call it, but Hearst, Hearst ended up dying um, while they were working on that piece. And so the the piece changed from Life Visits Marion Davies to a big spread on William Randolph Hearst and his life with Marion Davies. It was the first piece like that that had ever been written. And Stanley Flink got to got to write this piece based on his interviews with Marion for Life Visits Marion Davies and his access to the house and to uh, the, um, you, you know, he, ne he never actually met Hearst, but he was aware of sort of the ambiance of the relationship between Hearst and Marion. Anyway, so this, this big piece ran in Life magazine and Marion really liked it. She liked she he was a friend of hers before they even decided to 
do anything together this life is Mary Davies thing or, or anything else and so after this piece ran they remained you know they remained friends and Marion started thinking about the idea of doing an autobi doing an autobiography and she didn't want to do it with anybody the person who she was going to record the tapes with had to be a friend it couldn't be anybody that she you know any, any sort of stranger she would not open up to a stranger she didn't feel comfortable talking to anybody that she didn't know uh, about her life so Stan Flink being a being a reporter and a friend he seemed to be the ideal choice so Charlie Lederer, who was Marion's nephew, who also helped her a lot in her um, legal life and planning and, and that kind of thing, he went to Stan Flink and asked him, and Stan Flink said, yes, we'll do it. So they started doing it. They started recording the tapes. So much of Marion Davies' life seems to be kind of drowned in rumors, all kinds of rumors. And and it's clear you're working diligently to clear up a lot in your book. And that's the very important you know, goal of the book. I, what, what things were the most important to you to kind of set straight? I think the most important thing to set straight was that Marion Davies was not at all Susan Alexander, right? I mean, right. People, who, people who have seen Citizen Kane Citizen Kane lives on today as a really popular movie, makes makes all the top movie lists of all time. And, and so people watch it and people think this is Hearst, this is Marion. You know, it starts with this is Hearst, right? And then by uh, sort of by association, this is Mary Davies. And I think it's important to note that, first of all, with Citizen Kane, I mean, we could sort of go into a whole thing about Citizen Kane, but the characters are are melanges, right? They're they're mixes of different people, and uh, people think that it's 100% Hearst. Well, it's not, right? I mean, there are other people involved in the character of Kane, and by extension, um, there are a lot of a, a lot of people who are involved in Susan Alexander. And there's a character who's much more like Susan Alexander. That's Connor Walska, right? I go into that in the book a bit. And uh, the people don't know Connor Walska. They know Marion and they know Hearst, right? So anyway, we go into a whole big thing about that. But anyway, it's done a real number on Marion's reputation through the years. And it was important to me to show people how Marion Davies really was. And... What I found is that she was an extremely intelligent, talented, kind, generous person who always thought of other people before herself, sometimes even sometimes too much, right? And she was just a remarkable subject for me to for me to work with. Well, I thought it was interesting that she did seem genuinely good and giving, but, and I was surprised to learn how maternal she was, Absolutely, that she actually compensated for the lack of maternal instinct in her sisters, you know, with, yeah. with, with her, with her niece, for instance. Yes. Um, I, that was, you know, one interesting part of it. The other thing that I thought was really interesting was that, yes, she's genuinely kind and giving, but there was this part of her that felt so guilty for all she had and would overcompensate through deed and, and the way that she would give gifts. That passage where you were talking about friends actually rejecting expensive gifts. What was your take on that? I think it was maybe less feeling guilty for what she had. I think she was I think she was kind of more solid than that. I think it was more um she had she had some sense of maybe not being enough in some way. Um or at least this is this is her friend, these are her friends' interpretations, right? Her friends' interpretations are that she felt like she had to give people things in order for them to love her. Uh her friends felt that. And so the the quote from Frances Marion 
who was one of these friends who made a pact not to accept any gifts from Marion. This was Francis Marion, Eleanor Boardman, I think China Harris. They, uh, Francis Marion said that we, we made this pact not to accept anything from her because Marion, you've got to learn that we love you for you and not for what you give us. So her friends had a had a sense that Marion was that Marion's giving was some reflection of insecurity uh, on her part. And did that translate to her career? How she felt about her acting at all? Possibly, yeah. I think I think so. She she was very modest. Didn't really seem to think much of her talent, uh, of her abilities. And she always thought of her career as a job that she was doing. And and she was. She was a working actress. She had, had contracts that she had to abide by and, and everything. She was never a very dedicated star. Yeah. She wasn't like, I mean, I always talk about Joan Crawford, you know, Marion in comparison to Joan Crawford. Joan Crawford made an effort to maintain her stardom at all costs. Gloria Swanson, same way, right? There were there are people who are stars. Marion was not. Marion was an actress. She would go to work. She would do her job. She would come home. And then when it was over, it was over. I, I heard her say some things on her tapes that were kind of kind of like, oh, she really doesn't think much of her talent or of herself um, as 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 an actress. It was just a job she was doing. And I think that's really interesting because one thing, another thing that the book revealed to me was how incredibly popular she was. I knew she was loved. I knew she was successful and I adore her, you know, her acting, her movies, but, but I didn't realize how big she was, you know, in her heyday. Um, so I find it interesting that she was so willing to just let it go. Yeah, she was. She didn't ever let, let her success get to her head. Yeah. And I think part of it, too, was that you may remember from the book as well, that she never read any of her own press. Um, she she made a conscious choice to leave her own press at, you know, at the doorstep. <laughs> she didn't she didn't read any of it. That's very she helpful. She cut it first for that. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah. She, she said she said uh, W.R. taught me not never read anything about yourself. Yeah, in that regard, she had somebody there helping her to save her sanity. Now, just back to her actual work, though. I mean, there's so much variety there, and there's there's so much she was able to do. What do you recommend to people as kind of representative of the best of Marion Davies? I say it sounds a little cliche for people who know uh, who know Marion Davies, but I really do think that show people and the Patsy yes are the two best. Marion Davies work, works objectively. Uh, you know, show people is this tight masterpiece of a silent film. Right. And the Patsy shows what Marion Davies could do. She was at the top of her game at the in the Patsy, and she was having the time of her life. And you can see it, you know, somersaulting and kicking and doing all this mugging and impersonating people and she was just having so much fun yeah she was so goofy I mean don't don't tell me screwball didn't start with this woman <laughs> yes no she, it absolutely did yeah and you also talk about that actually about how yes. she really was the person that started that style yeah she doesn't get enough credit for that if really any at all uh she is the the mother really of this family of comedians Marion first, Carol Lombard, uh, and uh, Lucille Ball, and Carol Burnett. I think those are sort of the natural descendants. I think of Marion Davies' comedy. Agreed. Yeah, and and uh, she deserves to be known for that. Absolutely, and it really is. I think more than people realize that where she is funny, and there's a greater body of work. I think than is readily known. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And yes. It's a real contrast to the early stuff. It is a real contrast to the early. Stuff. Well, she was doing she was doing a little bit of funny. She she was getting it in there, you know. She was getting it in there in the in the early stuff, which is to Marion's credit. But but yeah, toward you know nineteen twenty eight, man. I mean, that is the year 
with show people the Patsy and the Cardboard Lover. That's it. So uh, yeah, the Cardboard Lover is also a really, really brilliant movie. We're going to show that at the Wilder Theater. January, there's going to be a retrospective at the Wilder Theater, and um, I'm going to be coming down doing a Q&A and presenting and and that kind of thing. And The Cardboard Lover is one of the movies that we're showing. So I'm really excited about that. Not, not enough okay. people have seen that one. And another, um, in terms of our sound films, because some people, some people prefer the sound, you know, sound era to silent era. It's a whole different art form. But the sound films, I think her pre-codes are fabulous. I mean, Five and Ten is a great movie. And Blondie of the Follies. Oh, I love that one. Movie. Yeah. Another one that we're doing at the Wilder is The Bachelor Father, which is, which is uh, really fun. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen that one. So what's that yeah, one about? Yeah, so we've seen Aubrey Smith. It's, uh, it's these three, I don't know if we would call them heirs, uh, but the three illegitimate children of a British nobleman, a, a wealthy, a wealthy British man. Yeah. Uh, they all come to stay with him unexpectedly. And they don't know each other. And anyway, it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun. It's, it's very pre-code in its way. I can see how that would be an excellent setup, especially for yeah. Marion Davies. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what do you think of those early ones though? Do you, do you find any value in, in the films that weren't exactly your wheelhouse, but. Definitely. Definitely. Yes. When I was in flowers, a brilliant movie. That's, that's really a, a great one. Um, Little old New York is also quite a good movie and you can find it, you you can find a lot of really interesting things that are done in those movies. Like for example, Marion has a signature in her early career of doing drag, right? I mean, she dresses up like she dresses up in boys' clothes a lot, and she does it so interestingly. She's so unique in her approach to to drag, and I talk about this in the book as well. Yeah. Um, uh, you know who also is does a really really bang up job of of uh, Marion Davies doing the, the drag thing is Janine Basinger in Silent Stars. She also talks very well about about that. There's a it's it's boyish drag. It is. It's boyish, but it's also feminine. Yes, that I I would especially say that about her dressing up as a bellboy and um her the cardboard lover one. Yes, exactly. <laughs> It, it yes. looks like Marion, and yet it does seem like this young boy out doing his career at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, funny. yeah. And she did it a lot in her early career, and she also did it a bit in her in her later career. Every now and then. So I mean, it's inescapable. You have to weave Hurst into every facet of Marion's life. She met him so young; he was with her so much of the way. And you know, I went into the book with questions, and I left the book with questions. This is such a complicated relationship. The power dynamics. It's yes. it's so hard to parse them. Like, what was your overall impression coming away from from spending so much time with these two and their unusual relationship? Yeah, we could we could approach approach that from any number of angles, right? We could say, what was their uh, what was their relationship like as a romantic couple? Uh, what was their relationship like as like mentor mentee? And what was their relationship life is almost a paternal, right? I mean, he was 34 years older than she was. And I think all three of those, all three of those approaches have validity and we have to figure out a way to weave them together in a way that sort of makes sense. Like they, they were certainly romantic, right? They were, they were soulmates and she, she functioned as a wife, Marion did. And at the same time, uh, Hearst was very protective of her, um, both as a as somebody who was so much older, and as a, the person who was watching over her career. So you leave the the book with questions. I left the book with questions. And it's, it's like it, it's difficult to make it's difficult to make sense of. Yeah, because it's so unusual that type of relationship. The thing that struck me, and you can see it in a couple of the of the photos, I didn't realize that playful element yes. was there in their in their relationship. I guess I always saw him as kind of the stick in the mud, and like 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 the, she saw something that no one else could see, but I could see what was between them, even in a photo of them grinning together. You know, she yeah, she brought out something in him. I think she brought out something in him that was there 
that nobody else up to that point, I think, had been able to to bring out. Yeah. This fun side to him. He you think of him as like a stick in the mud, but you know, every, and everybody does, right? Everybody's like, oh, William Randolph Hearst is sort of like big, dour, uh, powerful man. But I have video of him. I have home home movies of him in Europe with Marion dancing, you know, and, and at Hearst Castle dancing and just fun, fun. How do you reconcile that with the parts of him that were a little controlling? I mean, he actually had private detectives on her yes. <laughs> at points, you know? Yeah. You know, one thing that I say is that entire careers have been devoted to trying to understand William Randolph Hearst. And nobody can really seem to do it. That seems to be the takeaway from most books, most papers, or most anything that's written about Hearst is that he was kind of an enigma. And Marion understood him. Marion understood him very well, but not a lot of other people can um, get to the get to the bottom of exactly who Hearst was, because I think there were a lot of who Hearst was, right? There, right. there there's not just one who he was. He he was a he was a person of many different, how can I say, there were many different sides to him. I think that's the only answer because just when I th- I would start to feel like I was honing in on it. And then there'd be something like how they almost got married. Right. But then they didn't because of a business property. Right. A magazine that he wanted to hold on to. I th- I thought I didn't get the impression that he knew how crushing that was. Yeah. And and I think that that's probably I think that that's probably right, that he didn't quite comprehend or he was incapable of or he knew, but he was incapable of figuring out which was the correct decision, you know, because he was not used to his business and his private lives mixing in that way. So it was possibly just a mystery to him? Like he was a mystery to himself a little bit? I think that probably that's true. I think that he probably didn't understand himself very well. I mean, when you think about it, so much wealth and power, you know, two people in the public eye, it would make sense that it would be mysterious because it's a unique situation. There's really nothing like the story between these yeah. two. I mean, coming away from this with all this information that you've had, what what would you want people to know about the relationship? What do you think is as much of a key to it as you could get, you know? I think that what I would like people to come away from the book with is that they loved each other. They really loved each other. And Hurst, with all his flaws and all his faults, adored Marion and Marion adored him and and clearly understood him better than anybody else was able to and that their relationship was complicated but it was it was literally to the very end you know she was with him she was with him in every every moment you know up to the very end I think that that's I think that's the best thing we can come away with um, about about their relationship is just how much they loved each other. Kind of a little bit connected to that, but also about Marion on her own. I'm just thinking about all these friends she had and and how like she didn't want to play out this relationship in public or even display herself in public. She was private in some regards, and yet she knew all these people, some of the most famous people in the world. What did you take away as their perception of Marion? Well, what I can tell you is that the people that I talked to, um, the people I talked to who knew Marion were completely over the moon about her. I I kept hearing the same phrase over and over. I would call people and these people from these different parts of her life would all say almost the exact same thing. And that would be Marion was the most wonderful human being I've ever known. And nobody I, I didn't have one single person who said that they didn't want to talk about her. Wow. And that speaks a lot. That says a lot about Marion. That they wanted to speak in her behalf in a way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That says a lot about Marion and how people saw her. Well, I, I thought that having read the book, that the title of your book is is out. The Captain of Her Soul. Mm-hmm. It was interesting to me that she was in this relationship where she could have lost control. And yet 
she seemed very much to be a powerful person who was able to make her own decisions. What do you think gave her this strength to be able to really, in a lot of ways, be a feminist in the way that she protected her interests and led her life? It's an interesting question because somebody somebody asked me that the other day and I had to think about it. Uh, what made her that way? Because I think there are a lot of factors that go into anybody's life and into anybody the way anybody approaches anything. And I think a lot of it had to do with her upbringing. Um, her, her parents never quashed her energy, you know, let her sort of be herself and and develop that that confidence to make those decisions. She was making she she was working young. She was making her own money at 16 and learning how to invest it and learning how to um budget and give some here and some there and so she had to do that young and she learned those things. Hearst, by the way, never learned those things. <laughs> Hearst, Hearst was Hearst was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, and he just he, he could not handle money to save his life. <laughs> but but Marion did and could, and she had the the confidence from an early age to know what was best. You know, know what was best for her, for her career, for her money, for her this and that. So. So I think part of it was the confidence that was instilled in her by her parents, then the reality of having to deal with money young, and also just just her her temperament. I mean, she and, and her intelligence. She was, like I said before, she was very smart. Well, it, it's interesting because the more you learn about her, the more it seems that Hearst was lucky to get to know her. Yes. Like, like the, it, but there might be this idea that he did everything for her, but it really... In many ways, it seems like the opposite is true. Like, yes, it, it's symbiotic. They help each other. Mm -hmm. They did help each other. But she seems to have gotten him through some emotional, financial, <laughs> physical problems. And, and it was all her. Yeah, definitely. So is there anything you don't get asked about Marion that you want out there? All this talk about Marion, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe there's nothing left. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I feel like I fielded so many questions. Yeah, I've been I've been. Even though the book is just out this past September, I've been talking about Marion. You know, I do a, a yearly talk at the Annenberg Beach House every year. And so I get, I feel like I've been asked every question in the book. But, well, Marion, the, the way that Marion wanted to be remembered was through her clinic, her children's clinic. She said toward the end of her life, will probably be more remembered for the parties that I gave at the Beach House and San Simeon, but the clinic is the real joy of my life. And it really did make a lot of change. That was an interesting element of your book, um, hearing from people who were children and patients in that clinic and how it literally changed and maybe saved their lives. Absolutely, yes. And I was so lucky to get those interviews to get those interviews from, from those children who lived in the neighborhood and who were treated at the Marion Davies Clinic. And one thing that they said that I, that I find very, uh, very meaningful is that not only was the Marion Davies Children's Clinic providing health care, but it was also providing a safe haven for a lot of these families in the neighborhood that were facing a lot of racism. Mexicans, um, Japanese immigrants, that was the population of West LA by and large at that time. And this was the mid twenties and it was a really horribly racist time for a lot of people, but the children's clinic treated everybody equally. And th that was a, a real, um, a really nice thing that I think doesn't, pe people don't, people don't talk about that aspect of the children's clinic very much. It says a lot about the kind of person that she was, that that she would mm -hmm. put her heart into something practical and and address injustice, you know, all at the same time. Yeah. Well, I have to say, reading this book, I didn't think I could love her more. I didn't think, think I could respect her more, but I, I feel like exponentially more so after reading this. It was it was wonderful to get closer to her than I ever had. So I really appreciate your work on this. And um, you're talking with me about it today. Yes, it's my it's my pleasure. All of it is my pleasure. It's just been such a wonderful experience to be working with Marion as a subject for the past nine years. 
And it's it's my pleasure to, to be with you and thank you for having me on. For more information, including how to find Laura's book, go to watchingclassicmovies.com. Like the show? Please follow, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. I appreciate your support. This is Kendall Kruver, watching classic movies. Until next time.